episode um, starting now. And I think most of you at least have been to one of those salons before. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go into a, a long discussion about what those are. Um, just for everyone, I think, who may join a little later, um, I'm going to share a few infos on how to join those salons um, in the Zoom group chat. But I think, uh, you know, this one uh, is really, at least like what I would love to get out of it is to make it as much of a two-way discussion as possible. Um, I think uh, what I would, like, how I would love to start is I'll do like a little bit of a, like, I guess like quick intro into some philosophical aspects and then uh, you know Mark and Christine uh, can fill in and then I think we want to re really uh, get more of your feedback rather than uh, rather than uh, talk talk ourselves very much so um, maybe to give you a little bit of kind of like background info um, so Mark Christine and I have been kind of like drafting on a book uh, for a while now uh, that was mostly um, kind of like that arose out of the fact that um, kind of a lot of uh, our thinking about existential risk and um, kind of like could often be boiled down to a few principles, uh, technically two, three words to intelligent voluntary cooperation, which uh, even though those risks that we were thinking about were quite different, we still thought that like with those three words, um, you know, we could describe at least heuristics with which um, uh, it seems likely that we could uh, set up civilization uh, to be a little bit more resilient against a variety of different risks that we may be facing. Um, and um, those kind of uh, those principles were significantly, let's say, like different or like let's say um, under discussed uh, in our perception in the current uh, X risk um, kind of like universe that uh, we thought it would uh, it wouldn't hurt to kind of like lay them out in a book um, and 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 to see how we can kind of like set civilization up for long term success. So this, this is quite theoretical still, and I think. Um, you know, we want to apply, make it very, very practical uh, in this session with COVID. Um, um, and so I'm really happy that, uh, that we have a lot of uh, folks here with, I think, quite like a, a, right, uh, a diversity of, of viewpoints uh, on COVID-19. And um, we're hoping to get, uh, like, to at least to make those kind of like principles pretty actionable um, because we're currently facing uh, a risk, even though it's probably not existential, it is at least challenging to our civilization. So it would be, it's a kind of cool test case to see whether those heuristics and principles that we come up with in a book even fly. Um, and um, yeah, I'll be doing a very brief introduction um, into some of the kind of like thinking that has been going on in the X work space that we are kind of like reacting to a little bit. Um, and then we discuss uh, kind of a thing on a pretty practical level. Um, okay, so let's see if I can share uh, my screen. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Um, okay, super. Um, I think, can you now see my screen? Yes. yes? yes. Okay, let's do it in presenter mode. And you can now see it in presenter mode. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. So basically the idea is that we've been writing on this book on intelligent voluntary cooperation. Um, and this is basically like a decentralized, uh, trying to create decentralized decision architectures more and more uh, that would make civilization resilient against a variety of risks. Why it's interesting right now is because currently we are facing uh, this risk of COVID-19 um, and with this kind of like risk that has been like um, kind of like ruminating uh, or like uh, really like um, kind of like spreading across the world. Um, also the kind of like um, kind of calls or at least the kind of like praise of more top-down control um, kind of like responses to this risk uh, have been uh, have been somewhat prevalent at least in the media um, in particular like uh, China's response uh, to the risk uh, was often favorably seen um, and so why that's interesting is because we are kind of like facing um, like a, a very similar um, dichotomy in the general existential risk community and I think in how we think about many risks. So uh, I want to kind of like me uh, like quickly uh, like draw out how how um, like how philosophically one often thinks about those risks and then we see whether we can apply it. So uh, I think often uh, and this is like you know I just hacked those slides together just before the call. Um, and this is, uh, I'm hoping that I'm not doing 
uh, that I'm uh, doing uh, Bostom at least somewhat justice and not just um, having like a straw man of him here, um, but in a nutshell, really, um, like Boston wrote this paper, Vulnerable World Hypothesis, recently. Um, and, uh, and basically, he lays out that uh, currently the world is in those semi anarchic default conditions. And um, those default conditions basically risk that a small group of actors could uh, destroy civilization. That's called small kills all. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't use that phrase, um, but uh, I think it's often used in X with circles. And um, why, uh, what, what does he mean by semi-anarchic default conditions? Basically, uh, the kind of world is vulnerable to three things. Um, like on a national level, we have very limited capacity for preventative policing. Uh, so that would mean for um, uh, surveillance and interception by the state. On a global level, we have very limited capacity for global governance uh, that would be required to solve large scale coordination problems. And then we also are faced with the fact that we have a diverse motivation. So many actors are motivated by very different things, anything from self-interest um, to the apocalyptic residual, so to people that actively want harm for civilization. And he basically um, kind of like uh, makes the case that, you know, our world is really, really vulnerable to um, in a variety of risks, uh, anything from nukes and autonomous weapons to machine intelligence, nano-risk, bio-risk, and so on and so forth. Many of the risks we may not even know about yet Basically, whenever we're making a technological discovery, we're drawing um, uh, kind of uh, we're drawing balls out of an urn. So far, we've only drawn the technological discoveries that were good. So, like I think white balls, but maybe we eventually draw a technological discovery that's a black ball, um, that is uh, one which uh, uh, which uh, which would allow a small number of actors to cause um, kind of like civilization destructing harm, and give. Given the fact that we are in uh, those conditions of uh, like those semi anarchic default conditions in which we can neither on a national level and uh, try to do try to detect who those actors are and try to intercept them, nor can we on a global level actually get governments to do this. Um, this may actually allow like a small number of agents um, to use those uh, risks um, or to use uh, to use te technologies to kind of cause uh, massive uh, large scale harm. So the idea is uh, that unless we can kind of like uh, exit those semi-anarchic default conditions, um, we may uh, set civilization up for destruction. If not now, then perhaps a little bit in the future. What he proposes is this kind of like system that I call uh, of like more top-down control. He proposes a world that is both a mix of extremely preventative, uh, extremely effective preventative policing and a very strong global governance. So on a national level, um, you know, we need this extremely effective preventive policy that is powered by ubiquitous surveillance um, because individuals can engage in those hard to regulate activities uh, that must nevertheless be effectively regulated. So basically, uh, you know, a small number of actors may discover a technology that is um, kind of like as well destructive as nukes, but maybe as easy as just baking sand in a microwave. And we need to kind of like um, uh, I guess surveil and uh, surveil uh, those actors and try to make sure that they don't discover them and that they can't uh, can't uh, uh, can't engage them. That's on a national level. That's required by every by every government. Uh, but then international internationally, we need a really strong global governance regime um, because um, states may have incentives to not effectively actually regulate this. So given the fact that this is all cross-jurisdictional, that those technologies uh, don't stop at a border, um, you know, if some uh, states don't want act to actually kind of implement preventative, pol preventative policy, um, we need kind of like a strong kind of like um, international uh, co like um, global governance regime that incentivizes uh, states to implement this and punishes those that don't. And what we basically kind of like discuss in the book is a little bit that this solution, um, even though it is very tempting, and even though we often see it um, kind of like at least um, proposed or, um, or um, favored in uh, crisis times, uh, is actually itself really vulnerable. And Bostrom uh, also says that it is, um, but he in the paper doesn't at least um, states very much in, in why that is so. Um, in the book, we make a few claims, for example, um, solutions that kind of like favor top-down control on a national and international level actually limit the intelligence that can be applied to a problem. So by limiting experiments and by, living, by limiting kind of like this problem-solving ability that we often have, um, 
we're actively uh, like limiting the intelligence that can be applied to a problem. So we're actively, so we're trying to, go, we're almost curtailing our options and trying to fight uh, any risk that comes up. Uh, in addition to that, we're creating a single point of failure. Um, you know, it is so that if we have a very strong uh, national and international um, kind of like a uh, regime with top down control, we are basically centralizing the power for um, kind of global destruction, destruction in the hand of a few that are then very powerful. We may also be incentivizing the search for world destroying technologies. Um, and that's because, you know, once you have this kind of like very powerful apparatus in place, um, it probably has a, it has a strong incentive not to be displaced uh, by any other actor that it may perceive as a threat. Uh, and uh, a good way to ensuring that is itself kind of like um, uh, have technological superiority. Uh, so uh, that would, it may incentivize those kind of like uh, top down, um, top down actors to actively uh, search for those uh, technologies that are uh, that are quite well destroying to prevent uh, from from being superseded, um, and you may say, well, no, we just make sure that whoever is in power in those kind of like in national and international uh, kind of like top down control regimes just has good incentives. Well, uh, that's kind of easier said than done because on the one hand, you are kind of uh, creating a, a risk of an internal and external abuse. A, by creating this kind of competition for absolute power um, so that, uh, you know, may incentivize those that really shouldn't be on top to actively seek out those positions. And then, um, you know, to may, may, maybe be, maybe uh, corrupt, corrupt it in the kind of in the process. So this is kind of this argument of why the worst get on top. Um, and you're also kind of uh, creating this risk of external abuse. So even if you could make sure that we really only have the best of the best, the people that really want to save the world um, in those national and international uh, bodies, um, you cannot prevent um, them from uh, from being uh, abused by others, um, and, and they may be a really good a really good uh, target, uh, as I think we've seen uh, in a lot of um, let's say um, uh, in a lot of like recent like smaller smaller scale uh, examples by which uh, Google just by uh, kind of having centralized a lot of information. Uh, you know, uh, made them made itself be vulnerable to being served national security letters and so on, and to release that information even if everyone at Google uh, didn't want to. So um, you're you're creating kind of like those uh, those vulnerabilities as well. And then lastly, um, given that we have all of those problems that come uh, that kind of like come in tandem with um, potential top-down control, you actually uh, create a system in which maybe not all uh, governments or not other, all states agree that this is a really good path to do uh, of creating this national and international top-down system. So you are likely to encounter resistance. And if that's so, then uh, it's really unclear um, um, how to kind of like convince all other states to uh, opt into this very strong uh, global governance regime. And, uh, and, and they may actually, actually, and may perhaps rightfully so, perceive you as a threat. And so uh, perhaps you're creating this first strike instability um, by which uh, you may cause kind of like an, an international war um, or, or, or at least uh, like a, a major risk to civilization just by trying to implement the system in the first place. So um, those are, I think, a few risks that uh, we discuss in the book. Um, and in a, in a nutshell, maybe you could say that, you know, those kind of top-down uh, systems of control risk protecting civilization by preemptively destroying it. Uh, and really by leaving no civilization left to protect in the first place. So that's kind of the theory in a nutshell. We, what you want to be doing really is an alternative. And <laughs> this slide I just hang together one minute before the call. But basically what we spent most of the book discussing is this alternative of a world in, of, that is kind of like, um, that is marked by intelligent voluntary cooperation. So on the one hand, you want to, decrease vulnerability of the world to small kills all. So, you know, the world is vulnerable to a lot of bio risk and to a lot of uh, nano risk, potentially AI risk and so on. So you want to decrease uh, the world's vulnerability to those risks. But you also, on the other hand, don't want to create single points of failure of those top down solutions. Right. And often, I think, in um, kind of like crisis situations like ours, it is kind of constructed as almost this like dichotomy. You can only either either you do a little bit more of one, like you you either have an uncoordinated world in which uh, the world is more vulnerable to kind of like small uh, to kind of like small scale threats that can escalate, or you have really strong governance on the one on the other hand, 
um, and you kind of like have to choose between the two. And we're actually going against that. We're saying, no, 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 there is actually a third alternative possible. Um, you have to um, kind of like, you have to make sure that both of those risks, um, both of those risks don't, uh, are, are not a threat to you. And the way to do that is via decentralized decision architectures that increase our ability uh, to engage in more voluntary cooperation. On the one hand, um, you know, those decision architectures need um, to still make the world less vulnerable to those um, kind of like escalating risks. But on the other hand, you also want to make sure that whatever solutions you put in place um, uh, is kind of like watching the watchers and doesn't create uh, more problems than, than it solves. Um, it doesn't create a, um, a single point of failure. And Robin Hansen, I think in, uh, I think uh, the um, post is called why world governance uh, risks uh, suicide or something like that. I can, I can um, post the link in, in the notes, but he basically um, kind of has this um, kind of like really interesting post uh, that I encourage you all to read. Um, but he finishes with saying, but alas, central power risks central suicide either done directly on purpose or as an indirect consequence of other broken thinking in contrast in a sufficiently decentralized world when one power commits suicide its place and resources tend to be taken by other powers who have not committed suicide competition and selection is a robust long-term solution to suicide in a way that centralized governance is not um, and the whole uh, the whole article is really well, well worth reading but this is kind of like like the book or at least like part of the book as it's relevant to the discussion today, in a nutshell, on the theory angle. Uh, why is this interesting in the current crisis? Well, it seems that actually what we have in the current crisis is we have a world that is vulnerable and we have, like, let's call it a bio-risk. Um, and I know that it's not quite doing it justice, but we have this possibility of like um, this Kind of like a thing that originated on a like had a small kind of like origin that is now suddenly spreading across civilization and so we're really worried about civilization being vulnerable to those kind of like easily emerging risks um and what we also currently see is that one way to control that or one way that and china has at least uh, uh, tried to control this is via top-down control um and um you know uh, and 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 sometimes like uh, favored so by a lot of, I think, current commentators. And uh, so I think one thing that we may want to discuss today is, you know, here I wrote a few things that we discussed in the book about why kind of top-down control in theory is likely um, to be vulnerable as well. But what I would love maybe to Christine and Mark to take a step at now is first discuss how actually the Chinese response, even though it is, has often been applauded, may actually itself be pretty vulnerable and why it really wasn't optimal. Um, and then perhaps we can discuss a few ways in which we can actually uh, rely on more uh, voluntary uh, cooperation um, in trying to help um, solve uh, COVID on, uh, on a bit of a better scale. We've already seen a lot in terms of amazing community responses that have bubbled up, but maybe we can like um, uh, get a little bit more precise on them and maybe also how tools from crypto commerce and so can help us actually uh, in, in creating be better systems for this. But yeah, maybe for now, just uh, I want to kind of like give it to, to Mark and then Christine uh, to say a few words. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I would love all of you guys' input as well, because this was quite a mouthful, <laughs> but um, it may be it kind of like, ha it, it maybe serve as a nice kind of like theory coding around the discussion. Okay, Mark, you go. Okay, uh, Allison, that was a great summary of a tremendous number of points, a very nice framing of the whole thing. Um, the, with regard to China, uh, I, before I criticize anything here, I want to first compliment them. Uh, they really do seem to have done a tremendously good job and in some ways an unprecedentedly good job. At the point that, that, that they started to do massive lockdown, uh, the conventional wisdom uh, from uh, lots of uh, alleged experts elsewhere in the world was that once it reaches this stage, lockdown can't work. Uh, and for some, in some respects, lockdown couldn't work and it didn't work in the sense that it did escape into the world. Uh, so it was too late for that. Uh, but they took a, a very bold and unprecedented lockdown and they it looks like they achieved a, a a mitigation of the problem that was well in excess of what 
uh, uh, pretty much all external expert commentators uh, had expected. Um, so my compliments to them. Um, the, it's of course uh, famous that uh, it didn't start off on the right foot. Uh, it started off on exactly the wrong foot. Um, uh, uh, what's the name of the doctor that um, first tried to sound the alarm and... Lee. Um, yes, Lee, thank you. Um, and I thought he had the perfect phrase, which I should have thought to have in front of me here. Um, I think a healthy society should not have just one voice. So that really is like the perfect quote for what we're talking about here. So there's this, um, Karl Popper likes to say, or like, liked to say, um, that uh, for, for most of the history of political science, uh, the central question was who should rule? Uh, you know, is it the divine right of kings? Is it, you know, what's the right, what's the rules of succession? Who has the, you know, and all this. And we did better under some rulers than other rulers. So, you know, others, you know, if we can just get the right benevolent dictator, things will be great. So when you have a centralized decision structure, sometimes you're going to have an incident where a centralized decision structure actually makes a good decision. And then we can all look at that and say, well, great, if we only had a centralized decision maker that always made decisions that were that good, uh, that would be great. Um, but uh, we've, we've seen as COVID has spread elsewhere, especially the United States, uh, that the same kind of centralized decision making power can lead to disaster. And in the United States, it's quite striking. And I want to, and after I, I talk about this a little bit, I want to also come back to China. Um, uh, one of the things that this whole um, uh, phenomena has taught me, seeing this, the, seeing this um, incident unfold has taught me is the cultural difference between the software world that I'm in and the world of medicine. Um, in the software world, you generally create the things you need to create uh, and you put them out there, you deploy them and you don't ask anybody's permission. Uh, uh, we live in a world where you don't need to ask anybody's permission, where it's inconceivable that you might need to ask anyone's permission. So the whole ethos around it is grows up co-adapted to the fact that everybody's free to build technology and to deploy it and to look at other people's technology and to comment on it. Uh, um, and we've got this uh, completely decentralized system of innovation that leads to rapid innovation and uh, rapid creative destruction where um, uh, uh, even entrenched players know that their biggest threat is some, inno some startup in innovating in a way that threatens the uh, uh, whatever uh, technology they're entrenched in. In the medical field, it could not be more different. Um, there were people who could test. There were people who wanted to test, uh, who uh, had asked permission of the CDC and were denied. Uh, and um, uh, and the, there's this uh, crucial heroic uh, incident in Washington State. We, we first knew about the community spread in Washington State because of the, um, uh, that, that one person who uh, had asked was denied and then two weeks later asked again, was denied again and went ahead and tested anyway. That's the only reason we know when that we had community transmission at that point in, in the emergence in Washington State. So 
right now, we're all anticipating this tremendous bottleneck in ventilators, and we have a tremendous bottleneck in masks. And we've got this culture with this tremendous manufacturing capability, and we even have this, finally, these new emergency use authorization things that allow people to ask the FDA for permission under looser rules. And what's happened repeatedly from what I understand is that people went ahead and created solutions, asked the FDA for permission, thinking they would get them under this emergency use authorization. And after getting a paperwork runaround, ended up giving up. Um, so, um, so I think that what we need to understand is that there's a tremendous capacity for a decentralized reaction to threats like this that didn't happen. Um, but those of us in the software field and, and the DIY maker field and all these other places where people just build technologies looking over their shoulder at this thing can see the missed opportunity. Um, now, going back to um, uh, various other places, South Korea, China, uh, et cetera, uh, China is not in a is not simply more authoritarian than us. We're not simply less authoritarian than them. It's not a one-dimensional thing. Um, the degree of approval and, um, uh, and you know, difficult pre-approval procedures and, and paperwork burden and all that to just build and deploy things, um, if you're not stepping on political sensitivities, if you're staying away from anything that has political, um, uh, a political smell to it, uh, my sense is that the ability of people in China to build and deploy things is actually much less regulated than it is, than, than it is here. And what I do not know is how much of that help them build an industry which could build a hospital in 10 days. Uh, we can't build a hospital in 10 days. We can't build a hospital in 100 days. Uh, I don't know if we can build a hospital in 1,000 days, uh, three years. Probably we can. Um, but you know, that's two orders of magnitude. Um, uh, we need to understand. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, um, a gap in civilizational technological capacity that is very dramatic where they're ahead of us. And we need to understand that. We need to understand what the societal preconditions are that led to that. Great, Mark. All right, Christine, do you wanna give your consent and then we open it up? Sure. Um, first, in terms of this balance between top-down and bottom-up, by which we mean centralized versus decentralized problem solving, um, let's look at a number of different areas. And first I'll mention, it's really hard, I think, for me at least, to come up with uh, a, an example where a large part, uh, a large function of society is purely one or the other, right? I mean, in general, you've got some kind of a mix. So there's a question of balance. Uh, let's take what many people think is a simple, easy one, which is the military, right? The general attitude is, well, if you need to do military action, it's got to be top down. And that's just a general assumption. Um, I think it might be fun, Allison, to have David Friedman on, who wrote his, uh, the book Machinery Freedom, Freedom many years ago, where he will uh, argue the opposite. Now, has it been tested? I, I mean, David would be the one to uh, ask about that. But, but that's, a, that's an area where we, we say, all right, uh, in general, that's gonna be top down, it's gonna be centralized. Um, so, but of course, the, uh, you know, what supports the military is uh, you need a strong economy. You're not gonna win wars without a strong, strong economy. So let's look at the economy. Now, 
it was, it's not that long ago that people thought that the Soviet Union was going to be extremely economically successful because they had centralized control. The assumption was this was going to be, do the job for them. This was strongly believed by many people, not all that long ago. Um, so I think in general, people have kind of realized that's not true and that if you want a strong economy, you really need to let entrepreneurs and uh, do their thing. You need to have innovation and that those things don't fit well with top down. Um, what people often point at some of the Scandinavian countries and say, well, there's an example of, uh, you know, centralization working. But often if you dig in more deeply, you find, no, no, they've got a great centralized safety net, but on the business side, it's pretty lax actually. So uh, the, uh, the Scandinavian model is not really a centralized model per se. It's much more of a mix. And uh, on the economic side, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty free. So that's military, economic. Um, Allison addressed this question of um, existential risk, in particular, the one that, uh, that Nick Bostrom was addressing is artificial general intelligence risk. And, and that's the one where most people have just been assuming again that, well, it has to be top-down centralized. There haven't been a lot of explorations of the bottom-up decentralized approach. And that's the purpose of the book that Allison, Mark, and I are working on, the uh, Intelligent Voluntary Cooperation book. So, so we'll see, uh, you know, you'll all be seeing that book eventually, and some of you see what, will see it in draft for comment. So then, of course, with the, with the virus, we come up with the question of public health, right? We, we covered military, economic, we covered existential risk, especially AGI risk. Now we're looking at public health. Uh, public health has been an area uh, in general of um, human success. You know, we've come a long way in public health, primarily through centralized efforts. Uh, that's the assumption. I, I, I can't disprove it. Um, maybe somebody out there can, but uh, my general impression is, okay, that's generally going to be um, a centralized effort. Although, if you look at, well, where did the solutions that these centralized entities are enforcing, where did the solutions come from, right? Well, you know, there you need the innovation, right? There you need, um, there you need, uh, science doing their thing without being perhaps directly controlled. So, so I mean, directly controlling scientists would be, I, I, you know, the scientists I know, it's just not something you can do very well. If you want good science, you have to let them do their thing. Um, so, so public health is a challenging area. Now, people point at China and say, well, look how well they did. And of course, as Mark said, there are some things they did well, certainly. Um, building hospitals fast was absolutely amazing. Although it would be interesting to see how well our military could do if they absolutely had to. But um, so some of you have read probably this essay that's out there called The Hammer and the Dance, where uh, the hammer is the stage that the US is in now, which is we are in lockdown basically, and the lockdown is getting more harsh rather than less harsh. So we're in the hammer stage. Uh, China, is now in the dance stage, right? That's where you gradually lift the restrictions and try to get your economy get back going again. Um, so, so it's a great model, the hammer and the dance. Now, why did China have to do such a hard hammer? Well, it's because they had a stage beforehand, as Mark was, was explaining, which is the suppression. And the suppression was where, where the bad news about this thing was suppressed. Now, I would argue that it's, it goes with their centralized system. It's not that this was an unusual thing. They did the same thing with the first SARS virus. There was a suppression. And here we got suppression again with the second SARS virus. So I would argue that, you know, it's, it's not that this was a fluke that they had the suppression. It's intrinsic to the system. The system is set up to reward good news and apparently to punish bad news. And, uh, and, 
and that's an intrinsic part of, of their system apparently. So it's not just the hammer and the dance. You go to China, it's going to be the suppression, the hammer and the dance. So I think it's wrong to just point at China and say, well, look how well they did. They did some things well. They did some things really badly. Uh, and the bad things they did were early on. And one thing we've learned, right, about epidemics is it matters a huge amount what you do, or do early on, huge amount. Uh, so screwing up early on it, it has tremendously high costs. As, yeah, as I, I, yes, I, I, I want to point out that yeah. the U.S. also screwed up in an even more dramatic way early uh, after China, through you know, uh, through their good actions, gave us you know a month of warning, effectively where we could have mobilized that we completely squandered. Uh, and and um, uh, and if you take a look at a lot of the official outlets, the official the official expert voices, uh, I would say that the nature of information disclosure management from the Western official expert voices was almost suppression as well. Uh, that the people who saw this coming, you know, uh, fortunately in the West, the people who saw this coming could take to Twitter and some people and did get the message out, but still it was a tiny degree to which they got the message out before it became obvious to everyone. We really in, we really, in our society, didn't do that much better than an information suppression period early on. Right. So, um, yeah. as I was about to say, Mark, and I'm, it's good that you jumped in, but I was getting there. Um, so, that was China, you know, suppression, hammer, and dance. Um, and then, of course, look at the US, which we're very well familiar with. Did we have suppression? Absolutely. We had suppression from the top. Right from the president, we had suppression, right? Major league suppression. So, um, so it was a major fight to get this thing uh, into the public consciousness. And I know many of you uh, who are, who are uh, watching this right now and hopefully will be joining in the discussion, um, were participating in these efforts to get the word out. I know I did what I could, right? Uh, I spent February on it. So. So what happened in the US? What's our excuse? Well, here's, here's, here's my hypothesis, and it's not a happy one, I'm sorry to say, which is um, you can look at a centralized system and you can see, okay, here are the pros and cons of a centralized system. You can look at a decentralized bottom-up system and say, okay, here are the pros and cons of that, and, and they're pretty straightforward. You can come up with that list pretty easily. And then look at the US and go, well, what's our system? It's a mix for sure, but my hypothesis is that we may be in some kind of a local minimum in terms of benefits from our system. Um, we have enough top-down control that people at the bottom have a heck of a time, and Mark gave us some examples, they have a heck of a time getting stuff done. You mm -hmm. almost have to break laws and rules in order to get things done, and you're taking a terrible risk. Not, not almost. Thank you, Mark. So, uh, you, you actually do have to break rules. And, and I don't blame people who are worried about that. You know, you could, you could be seriously punished for these things. Um, physicians could lose their license, lose their living, things like that. Um, so so we, we have enough bureaucratic top-down control that it's seriously inhibiting bottom-up action. But one of the things you see in China in terms of uh, one of the benefits of centralized control is if you have a centralized system, you can actually attract some pretty talented people, not necessarily good people, but very talented, intelligent people uh, to, to run that system because they actually get to make decisions that are implemented across a huge space and they can have a huge impact. Now, who do you know in the US who wants to be president? It's a horrible job, right? Uh, and look who we have right now, right? We, we don't have somebody, we have not, the, the position has not attracted someone who is able to make good decisions in this space. So we may have the worst of both worlds. We may have 
the downsides of both systems without the up without significant upsides of either one. Um, which and if that's true, if we're in a local minimum of benefits, we need to make a decision of which way we're going and head in that and push hard in that direction. Um, obviously, you can tell from our book title which way Mark and I and Allison would push and how we would say we should what direction to head in to try to improve things. Um, but maybe at this point, Allison, um, either you might have a few words to say or you might want to open it up. I'm not sure. Any comments from anyone? Chime in. Yeah, yeah. go for it, Nick. Yeah, um, I was jotting down a, a few thoughts. Uh, I feel like you're talking a lot about using these, these two sets of words, centralization and decentralization uh, and bottom up and top down. Um, and for one, it's a little unclear if you're, if you're talking as if they're the same axis or if they're different axes. Uh, but beyond even that consideration, I kind of wonder if what, what's trying to be described by using those words in different places is more um, diversity versus monoculture sort of a situation, um, wherein like uh, this, this is an infection and there's different ways that people are handling it. Um, and just like, it, it feels like there's a parallel with like biological ecosystems and the monoculture versus diversity situation with or in human organizations, how we handle it um, beyond that. Um, and then, um, yeah, that, that's the, the worthwhile comment. I've, I've got some pushback on, on some of the, the, uh, the idea that we can't build a hospital in a week. There's a number of cultures and situations around the world. A few notable ones are in the US that do that. Uh, you know, granted, they're not full surgical hospitals, but um, you know, there that are. One was, that one wasn't the full surgical hospital either, so that so it might be a fair, fair comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I posted links in the chat to to the U.S.'s approach versus China's approach there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you know, but I think that just informs as to you know what uh, what Christine was pointing out about the the balance between you know, which which things do we have as top down and which things do we have as bottom up and how are they interacting as a system i think it just makes that that examination more interesting um, and then uh, recently something crossed my feeds that talked about how the us military approach is actually to educate the crap out of their ground people um, so that they have the most flexibility in the moment so it's the least top down According to this, which I, I wish I had the source at hand, uh, it's the least top down as possible when you are the person on the ground. Uh, I've heard that. I've heard that yeah. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a very, very nice discussion in uh, Tetlock's book uh, of super, super forecasters, super, um, uh, uh, where he talks, about, I think it's in that book, uh, where he talks about uh, the um, uh, the German military uh, and why uh, the German military has been so effective and it's uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, of localization of decision-making power, of, of trying to avoid unnecessarily sending decisions up the chain of command and giving people more locally more autonomy to make the decisions that they need to make. Yeah. And and that's obviously that's that that's that's one of these mixtures because there's still overall a hierarchy, just a hierarchy that chooses not to to be as little of a bottleneck as possible uh, at the top, but it still has ultimate authority. So that's that's one kind of semi decentralization, and that's very familiar to any of us who work in a large company. So. Um, I, I kind of feel like there's another there's another axis here that that's not yet been named that uh, might be something along the lines of empowerment versus uh, disempowerment, right? So there's a degree to which the central is uh, the top down versus bottom up is really a question as to empowerment, um, where you get you get a, a, a situation like what you just described with the German military, where you go forget all that, let's work on an entirely different um, way of doing things, where top-down and empowerment are not at odds, where you're saying you're giving a top-down empowerment and now, now you can do both without them fighting. Yeah, uh, in, the, uh, right. in the crypto commerce blockchain space, uh, there's a lot to learn about different, kind of developing a more refined taxonomy of, of ways in which things that can be centralized and decentralized. Um, the, um, 
uh, I like to use, I, so I've, I've started using the phrase um, loosely coupled decentralization uh, versus coordinated decentralization. These aren't great terms, but uh, a single chain like a Bitcoin or like an Ethereum is in one way highly decentralized because there's no single point of failure. There's no one participant that if they go bad can corrupt the system. And that includes nations because it's spread out over the globe it's multi-jurisdictional. Um, there's no one nation that can succeed at corrupting the thing. So it's, it's very, very highly fault tolerant. So that's, you know, that's one form of decentralization. But on the other hand, the entire thing has to be tightly coordinated and it repeatedly has to come to a single consensus decision. That's what, that's what the whole consensus mechanism is about, is everyone has to arrive at the same unitary decision over and over again. Um, I wanna contrast that with uh, the internet and the web uh, and the, the IETF notion of loose agreement on protocols. Um, where uh, people putting, you know, putting machines up on the internet or putting web servers up speaking HTTP and HTML, um, there was tremendous architectural diversity. There was, no, there was never any time where everyone had to agree on any one decision. There was not a single global decision to pretty damn close first approximation. There's, you know, you can, you worry about ICANN off to the side. Um, uh, but leaving that aside, uh, uh, by and large, the dynamics of the internet was um, uh, decentralized in the sense, in much more of the uh, Ostrom polycentrism sense, in the sense that, uh, that uh, of avoiding there being a single decision that everyone had to participate in or be subject to. And I think this relates directly to the questions that Allison was starting with and the, the quote from Robin Hanson, which is, if there's no one global decision, then there's no one global bad decision. And if there's a diversity of global decisions, you don't have to know at the time which ones are bad. Uh, the, you often, we often never know at the time which ones are bad. Uh, the way we survive making decisions that in retrospect were bad is that some parts of the system as a result die and, uh, and, and the rest of the system grows to take their place. Um, so, uh, so I think that's the most important form of decentralization uh, is, is, um, uh, is the decision-making architecture rather than uh, the corruptibility of individual agents, but both of them are, are, are key. Yeah. All right, we have Kian up next. Hi, um, okay, a number of things. I don't mean to uh, be too contrarian here. I think blockchain is irrelevant. I have to say there's no way that any, there's no way that the, we're gonna have a worldwide consensus on what to do and how to approach the trade-offs of shutting down the economy versus trying to stomp out the virus. Uh, blockchain consensus is fine for doing a hash and figuring out you know, um, uh, if there's double spend, but in terms of making political decisions, uh, not as it stands. Okay, so now you have different ways of making political decisions. You have the Chinese way, which is essentially uh, authoritarian top-down. It has advantages and disadvantages, you have the U.S. way, which is more uh, pluralistic, decentralized, and so let's do a comparison here very quickly. Um, we have the Chinese way. So we've talked about some of the advantages that may have happened. We've also hinted at the disadvantages about the suppression near the beginning, but it's not really the suppression in my mind that is the key defect of the authoritarian Chinese style system. The problem is this idea that 
they don't want to hear things with a political spin and they don't want to hear bad news. The problem is that certain information that comes in from the sensor network, which is the civilization, which is the people, gets ignored, suppressed, repressed. And so they're actually, um, that kind of a system actually willfully cuts off the very inputs that it needs to do the right thing in a lot of cases. Uh, now, on the other hand, the US system, roughly speaking, okay, the Chinese system is kind of, it, in spite of those flaws, it's run by technocrats, you know, uh, Prime Minister is a is a is an engineer, right? So they have a they come with that set of advantages. They are um, technocratic and they have an authoritarian system which to implement these technocratic decisions. The U.S. system, on the other hand, is run by lawyers and lobbyists. That's very bad. They don't understand the technical details. But on the other hand, their whole job is to make compromises and to uh, reach agreements. Um, there are corrupting influences, to be sure, but they, they reach uh, agreements uh, by compromise. So once again, I mean, I could go on, but I shouldn't. This is not my talk. I just want to say that it's a situation, rather than thinking about Chris, what Christine was saying, uh, that it's a local minimum, our system. I think what it is, is it, this, I see this over and over again, and I've seen it long before this virus. It's a situation where if we were able to create, as Mark suggests, in a way with his idea that certain things die off and certain things prosper. If we're able to create a system that combines the best of the technocratic Chinese system with say the pluralistic, um, more free press oriented US system, if we can create a hybrid that combines the best of both, we're gonna do very well. If on the other hand, we continue to create hybrids that are the worst of both, then we're in deep shit. So I think it's important to try and extract from all the different responses by different countries and different groups to this crisis and other crises, subsets of things that work, subsets of things that don't work and make a hybrid system that has vigor, which includes the best of all systems. I think uh, one thing, uh, and Mark, maybe you could speak to that was yesterday in the discussion on contact tracing, um, you know, I guess like a few different ways in one, like even for contact tracing, there seem to be a few different ways in which one could be going about doing that in, in which one could be going about collecting data and storing data. And perhaps, you know, you want to kind of like uh, say in, in terms of that as an example, um, what would be uh, more decentralized uh, approaches to doing that, that, um, you know, would allow more voluntary cooperation across individuals without kind of like risking um, uh, risking um, the fears of top-down. Okay. Uh, uh, before I do that, I want to just respond to Creon a bit. Um, I like I like uh, ev pretty much everything you said, uh, except that I would not, by the best of both worlds, I would not seek to have a more technogra technocratic central ruling body. I want to just I want to be um, uh, more de. I, 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 I think the way forward for us is to just be more decentralized in as many ways as we can. I completely agree with you with regard to blockchain. I hope that was clear from my blockchain comments, which is uh, the loosely coupled decentralization where there are many, many different decisions and there's no, never any one overarching decision uh, is very much the, the system that I favor. And th that a, block, a single blockchain considered by itself is an example of, of what I don't like. Uh, okay, so now, now to answer uh, Allison's question. Um, the, um, right now there is a tremendous corpus of useful information that could be used productively for contact tracing if we can figure out the privacy issue. Uh, and uh, uh, cryptographers with things like uh, zero knowledge proofs and multi-party secure computation uh, have been able to take problems that seemed to need um, the, the, the raw information uh, to compute something and successfully blinding it so it can compute with, without revealing the information. Um, 
so I don't know the limits on what's possible there. Um, so I'm going to start by assuming away the privacy issue. So let's just assume that nobody's concerned with privacy. We're willing to take all of our personal information and just make it available. Um, uh, what could you do with contact tracing you know, in that hypothetical world? <coughs> uh, right now, there's this extraordinary corpus of existing information, which is people with Android phones who uh, have their geotracking on. Uh, so the geotracking, uh, if you've ever taken a look at sort of your, your, I forget what you call it, but the Google Maps thing of just showing, show me my history of motion through the world, it's rather amazing to actually kind of walk back over the history of your paths through the world and see how much of it are things that you had forgotten. Um, but you can kind of remind yourself when you see it. Um, if you had that from many different people, you could see when multiple people were at the same place at the same time. Uh, that's not enough yet for contact tracing because a lot of that is that you didn't actually encounter each other, you just happened to be in the same place. Uh, as uh, uh, somebody, I think it was Peter, uh, was emphasizing uh, in the, the session, that other session, um, the contact tracing, you have to have, um, you, you have to have a high hit rate because if you ask too many casual contacts, um, uh, then people stop taking it seriously. So the second idea is that uh, the other part of the corpus is people's contact lists. So together with their paths through the world and their contact lists, you could do, do a data mining heuristic like uh, if, uh, if A was in B's contact list and B was in A's contact list and they were both at the, in the same place at the same time for at least 15 minutes, well then they probably noticed each other and had a conversation and just something like that. And then you could just take this tremendous stock of information um, and then when you find out that somebody's positive, try to trace it back and alert other people and, uh, and you know, get the information needed to trace the contacts further. Uh, now, how much of that, if you just try to do that directly, well, I would refuse to give up the information needed, even though I know how much it's needed. Um, because uh, the, we also need to think about the consequences for the kind of society that we're in after this particular emergency is over. Uh, if a privacy preserving way of effectively providing the information so that this calculation can be done over it uh, were found, uh, then um, and the privacy preserving nature of it were credible, which is the hard thing. How do you make it credible to people who, you know, um, uh, can't follow the, the mathematics of it? Um, and I'm certainly one of the people who cannot follow the mathematics of it. Um, but uh, if you can do that, I think that uh, that's, that's a good decentralized approach to contact tracing. Uh, it doesn't require, um, uh, it doesn't require a central body to be making decisions if the information people are revealing is not uh, is not costly to them to reveal. They can reveal it to multiple such bodies who are trying to scrape and put the picture together. No, okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think uh, unless there's a there's a comment towards that, we we just had a comment from Mike who raised his hand. Yes. Um, well, actually, what Mark just mentioned does bring to mind blockchain as a solution after some of these things that hey, you put the social graphs on a uh, blockchain and still anonymize it you know, make it private, preserve the privacy in that manner. So, but yeah, I realized actually he was just using blockchain as kind of an analogy or an example of a decentralized consensus mechanism. And actually on blockchain, not everyone has to arrive at a consensus. Um, only a majority has to 
arrive at a consensus, whatever like a quorum is decided to be in a particular blockchain system. And of course you have forks, you have like subgroups, you can have different localized islands of in their own consensus that eventually settle into an overall consensus. So I kind of want to bring up too that in a way, this whole situation now is a really a grand failure of a centralized planning system and, and highly centralized control. The reason we don't have a lot faster vaccine creation and more advanced tech in the medical field it is because it's been so centralized and closely regulated for so long that the lack of progress, we're seeing the result of that now. So. At least that's my take on it. And we haven't really seen an example of a decentralized alternative. It'll be interesting as this plays out, we'll be able to see the numbers and how, you know, how the um, pandemic progresses in different regions that have different amounts of centralization versus decentralization. For instance, in Mexico, you can buy a lot of drugs over the counter and a lot cheaper without a prescription. Whereas here you have to go and get a prescription and the uh, cost is a lot higher. So just some of my comments on that. Yeah, South Korea is gonna be, I think the, the interesting, I think, I think for the next 10 years, we're all going to be looking back over what happened this year and trying to decipher it, to do forensics over all the different things that happened this year and, and uh, the different kinds of institutional failure and success. Uh, but I think South Korea is an especially interesting one. And they're a, you know, free democratic system. There's no uh, obnoxious tyranny in charge of South Korea. All right, we have another hand up from Christy Dudley. Christy, a question? Okay, you may be unmuted in case you're trying to speak. And Fred, I'm seeing your hand as well. Also, David's hand is up. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Christy, ah, yes. Yay. Figured out how to unmute this. Sorry about that. Um, well, I'm, I'm hearing, actually, I kind of want to piggyback on uh, Mike's comment. Um, I, I can't help but feel like there's some hubris involved in saying that we are, that China is very authoritarian and we are very free. I, I tend to want to piggyback on Mike's comment that we're not really all that free. The reason we can't build a hospital in what, six days, six years, is because of all the permitting and all the environmental um, environmental impact and all the all the um, regulation involved the contracting and the legal structures involved as well as if if it just came down to getting guys out there we would be able to do that but we don't have the freedoms um, but it's different kinds of freedoms we have regulation on our freedom to make sure that uh, people aren't stepping on each other's toes and so on and so forth. So um, in, in a way, I, I agree, we consider the, the minimums and, or the, the way we approach things, but we need to also consider that we are already regulating. So yeah, I, I agree that we're totally at uh, uh, looking at a, a potential for a um, a local minimum because we have existing regulation. And China is not terrible. I, I know a lot of Chinese people who are very happy to live there. And it's, it's just a question of degrees and what is acceptable regulation. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Fred, you have a last question. And then perhaps Mark and Christine, you want to do final comments and that's how we close out. Okay. Uh, uh, when Mark was talking, uh, two things came to mind. Uh, first is when we're talking about social tracking and other related things, my intuition is that part of it, uh, how people respond to that, would be the reputation, not of sort of saying government as a whole, but the individual agencies. So 
an agency like the CDC might have a better reputation than, for example, the TSA, just based on people's interaction. And that, and so if that is, if we go along this path, the, there's sort of a, 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 which path you take by agency may have something to do with how it's implemented, but also how it's received. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing real quickly is, uh, there is a, talking about the, the response by private uh, companies. If you've not seen the article about HEB stores, uh, they early on before hardly anybody in the anywhere was talking about this, they internally looked at what was happening and said, this is gonna be a big deal. And they, had, they went through a whole series of steps to prepare their food stores. And it's worth reading that article to see what they did because they basically took, took their own initiative. I recommend it. I think, uh, is Super. it David? Thank there, you. Mark, some... do you want to answer? Uh, Mark, you like answer I'm... and make it your final comments. Well, so I think, there, is it David? Uh, if there's somebody who's had his hand up for a while. Yes. Yes. Uh, you're, mute, you're muted. Okay, good. So I, I just had that um, sort of, very similar to the way that stores had some freedom of action. We actually have each county has a health department, which is coordinated with each of 50 states in the United States. And while there was central control of testing and certain key regulatory decisions about monitoring, the actual steps to be taken in mitigation and control, the trade-offs made about local costs and how to defend the employees who are first responders, blah, blah, blah. That's actually very devolved and decentralized in the United States. We have a truly federal system when it comes to quarantine and disease control. All right, now, uh, Mark and Christine, you uh, can answer to those and make those also your final comments, and then we drop off. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so so uh, the, the point about the federal system and the local decision-making, I, I, I first of all just want to to um, uh, emphasize, um, to agree and, and emphasize how important that is. Um, uh, it's not just that the, you know, gov uh, the government is best which governs least, it's also the decision-making is best which is most local. Uh, the, the, the polycentrism of the Ostroms uh, is, that, uh, is basically that each decision uh, should be done as locally as possible given the nature of the decision. Uh, and a lot of these can be done very locally. The, the summary comment that I want to make is, is um, that progress in the United States, institutional progress, um, uh, has often been by civil disobedience. Um, uh, there's, of course, the civil rights, civil disobedience of you know, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. There's the uh, Vietnam civil disobedience of burning the draft cards, and uh, there's a um, uh, very important history of civil disobedience in crypto in the um, 80s and 90s that's, that needs to be more widely appreciated, but the export controls of the 90s were really overcome by a wave of civil disobedience, and it was a wave of civil disobedience that was driven by the understanding of technologists of the liberating power of crypto and the um, revulsion at the idea that crypto would be suppressed because, because this was the, the liberating technology. And a lot of this battle was fought by people for whom the, the memory of these other forms of civil disobedience and the kind of progress they made was still a fresh memory. Um, I think that I would like to call for um, the creation of a legal defense fund so that on the margin, uh, people with 3D printers, people with other manufacturing technologies, people creating open source ventilator designs, uh, people creating testing kits that, um, uh, that to a large extent, we, we, if we, any individual who deploys such a thing without regulatory approval is taking a huge chance. And hopefully because there are lives at stake, some people will do that anyway, and we've seen that. Uh, uh, 
to the degree to which we can encourage a perception that more people will, will engage in the civil disobedience because they expect more other people to engage in it. And this is the kind of phenomena for which there is safety in numbers. Uh, we can, by doing this, make the cost of regulation and our revulsion at it clear and possibly overcome it. And a legal defense fund can help at the margin to reduce the risk of those who, who, who take these actions. Thank you, Mark. Okay, now, Christine, some closing words. Okay, to wrap up. So um, I put out the idea there that uh, in the U.S. today, we've got the downsides, a lot of the downsides of both uh, top-down and bottom-up and uh, without the full benefits of either one. And uh, Mark is suggesting we just push toward more freedom, and I certainly sympathize with that view. Um, Creon is suggesting we try to come up with an interesting mix of the best of both. Um, and Creon's a smart guy, too. So. Um, I think uh, the way to work this out would probably be to, uh, to take a shot at it at least, would be to uh, have one of our foresight workshops where we say, all right, let's try to uh, come up with, uh, let's take a particular sector. Maybe we would take uh, you know, the next pandemic as an example and say, all right, let's design something. Let's, let's let's really get into the nitty gritty details because I don't think we can solve this by staying at abstractions because now we're just going with our gut, you know, we're, we're going with our gut level um, intuitions about which way to go. But I have a feeling if we were to sit down and really thrash it out and say, fine, let's, let's come up with a system to address the next pandemic um, and have Creon there and have Mark there and have a whole bunch of people there, ideally people who know some history uh, would be super helpful, uh, as well as technology and science. Foresight's always very strong in those areas, but history is super relevant here too. So, and just thrash it out. I'd love to see that happen. And it would, we'd all, I think, learn a lot. I certainly would learn a lot. So that's my suggestion for how we resolve this, what is a kind of a philosophical difference? Um, but I think it would be very educational and interesting and might actually be useful. So that's it. Yeah, thank you. I think, I mean, whatever language you use, you know, you're barely scratching the surface. Things are definitely more complicated than you can kind of like make believe in like two or three or whatever words. Um, I think that, you know, kind of like using different like models for abstraction of the world is useful to some extent, but, you know, the world is always a little bit more complicated than that. And, and, uh, and, and um, fortunately so. Um, so I think, um, you know, maybe taking more and more example cases would, uh, would, would, would be really good. I would certainly be interested in doing that. Um, I mean, this is just like one way in which kind of like we recently got reminded of a few ideas that we are uh, writing in much more detail in the book about, you know, how they may or may not uh, be relevant to the current situation. I think there are a lot of parallels, obviously. Um, um, obviously, uh, it's a complex situation. That being said, um, if any one of you is interested in kind of like uh, seeing more of the book chapters and being more involved in that discussion, uh, please uh, feel free to drop me a note. Um, I think, uh, you know, the next coming weeks and then our like discussion thereof for the next coming years, I think will kind of like definitely shed some light on, um, on I think like the different frameworks that are currently at play. Um, and with that being said, uh, I think uh, we may or may not uh, get like a meeting together uh, in person later this year. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, joining and, and it was really, really nice to have all of your inputs. Thank you so much, Alyssa, to you, uh, kind of like for putting some empirical evidence out there um, that is, um, was definitely really useful to see. I mean, what the hell, this movie about uh, the, the next pandemic that is fucking insane. Um, wow, this is totally nuts that that was in November. I mean, wow, I'm totally mind blown. You, uh, anyway, that's a fun one to watch tonight. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Okay, what the me? hell? I'm totally going to watch that now. <laughs> all right. Well, th that's a fun one. Um, with that being said, a fun uh, Sunday night to all of you. 
why don't we all watch uh, watch that documentary and uh, and 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 see how how paranoid we get afterwards all right thank you everyone have a lovely lovely sunday evening thank you for joining bye see bye. many of you tomorrow oh by the way